All right, welcome back to Making the Argument. We got a special episode for you today because a lot of the discussions that we have had lately have been how do we fight back against federal overreach? How do we fight back about what's going on? Are, are the states the proper way to do it? Because the answer can't just be voting harder, right? If voting harder worked, well, then we, we'd, it'd be working. And one of the biggest issues that have come up lately is something called lawfare, right? They look at everything that's going on, a lot of the things within certain aspects of the DOJ, certain uh, district attorneys, just going after conservatives in, in all kinds of ways. And it always feels like we lose these battles. But what's interesting is I have a guest today that has won a lot of these battles, has actually fought back against federal overreach, and has won in court, and has done this at the state level and at the federal level. Because my guest today is the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Jason Miares. General, how are you doing today? <laughs> It's always odd when somebody calls me general because I think I look over my shoulder, I expect a Marine staring over me. So I like to say I'm, I'm happily married with three daughters. I may be a quote unquote general in the office, but I'm just a private at home. Yeah. So, uh, but it's great to be with you, Nick. No, well, thank you very much. Well, to give the audience a little background too, full disclosure, um, I, I have known Jason Mieris since, since before he was the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia. In fact, we came into the Virginia House of Delegates together as freshmen and uh, and I want you I want you to give the audience a little bit of background, but I'm gonna here's the way I'm gonna tee this up. You and I both uh, are are not big fans of Karl Marx, and and I've spoken a lot about this, and I have just tried to tried to just take it down philosophically from time to time. But I remember you giving a floor speech uh, with respect to communism and and a and a particular communist regime, and I remember thinking to myself. Man, I, I despise communism, but for this guy, it is personal mm. in a way mm. that it just isn't as personal with me. So yeah. g give everyone some background on why that is. Well, I would say that, uh, you know, when I travel around Virginia, sometimes I'm asked what kind of name is Miares, and I like to say, well, it's Southern. <laughs> it's deep south, <laughs> deep uh, south, 90 miles off the coast of Florida, <laughs> Cuba. Uh, and that obviously influenced uh, so much of my life. Um you know, I do have I do have to digress real quick. I do remember how I was going to that that when I came into the House of Delegates with Nick Friedis, uh, I quickly realized I was going to click with this guy because he and I were about the only two that had a copy of Frederick Bestier's The Law in our office. <laughs> yeah. um, but going back to my family, um, you know, C.S. Lewis said that of all the tyrannies in the world, some of the worst tyrannies are the tyrannies done for your own good. And the problem with Marxism is this idea that on paper it may sound great, uh, but the reality is it completes you ro completely robs you of your individual dignity and your ambition. And so that's what happened to the Miara's family in Cuba uh, on so many different levels. Um, one of the great stories that have been passed down in my family is that my mother's dream was to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And she was enrolled at the University of Havana, and her first day of class, she walks in. Uh, to take classes in biology and chemistry. She really wanted, her dream is to be the first female doctor of her family and one of the first in her hometown ever. And uh, they told her, we're sorry, the party, uh, the greater good, it does not need another doctor. Uh, we need teachers. So you have to take classes in Marxist-Leninism. And you get for the greater good, you can't chase your own dreams. You have to do what the party, what the wise elders are telling you. And that was one of her early experiences with this idea of living in a society where the individual dignity is replaced with the collective. And then you take on top of that the idea of what communism is, was it takes out the, removes the individual. It teaches as well from an early age that your first loyalty is to the state. Uh, that means even betraying your family. Uh, one of the things, even to this day, they will tell you uh, to report all counter-revolutionary activity uh, in Cuba. And so my mother saw uh, very quickly what Castro, Castro promised to restore democracy. Uh, Cuba was a republic for a long time. Then they had a, a two-bit dictator named Batista who had taken over. And Castro had promised, put me in power and I'll restore and I'll bring freedom in elections. I'll restore the uh, Cuban Republic. Of course, they had one bad dictator replaced with another. It was actually far worse because Castro decided to adopt communism and socialism and uh, ruin the country. And so I love to point out when I speak to, to high school students, the year Fidel Castro took power in Cuba, Cuba had the same GDP as Italy. Mm. And the year that he died, uh, Cuba had the same GDP as socialism. And so 
when my mother finally same got GDP it, is who? Uh, sorry, it's Sudan, Sudan. Sudan. They had the same, same GDP as Sudan. He turned what was at the time one of the most prosperous countries in all of Latin America uh, to one of the poorest. And, um, you know, my, my uncle Angel Miares, unfortunately, got the worst end of the stick in, in uh, Castro's form of, of rehabilitative justice, which is to take you away in the middle of the night, put a gun to your head, take you to an empty baseball stadium, and uh, have you go through a mock execution. And his crime was that he had handed out anti-Castro leaflets mm. uh, in Havana and, and had then later refused to form a, a communist militia. Um, he was ruthless, and he, it always amazes me when I hear these leftists say, well, Cuba has socialized medicine. Uh, Cuba has increased their literacy rate. Well, what's the, what's the point of increasing your literacy rate if you have entire books that are banned from reading? And so what, what struck me as well was, um, you know, the last thing they did was, um, before my mother left Cuba, is the government comes to your home, and they put a seal on your door. That's the price you pay. It's not like if you and I were to immigrate to Ireland, we maybe transfer our bank account, box up our things, we go overseas. Uh, they came to your door, and they put a note on your door that says, property of the socialist revolution. Mm. And imagine this, Nick. Somebody comes to your house, and at that moment, everything that you own in this world, every note, every memento, every picture, every piece of clothing, any jewelry, anything you want to hand out to your children, anything you have in your bank account, that is all confiscated from you, all in the name of what? Equity. Mm. And uh, at that point, you have nothing in that world. Your home has been taken away from you. All the money you have in your bank account has been taken away from you. Other than the clothes you literally have when you drive to the airport is taken away from you in the name of collectivism. Mm -hmm. And you get on that airplane literally with nothing. Um, and that leaves a huge impression and a scar on any family uh, because you see how it distorts society. Um, and I remember asking my mother, how in the world did Cuba, that was one of the more prosperous Latin American countries. How did it, how did it fall into communism? And she said, uh, everything got labeled. Everyone got labeled oppressor or oppressed. And you could justify a lot of evil if you're doing it on behalf of the oppressed mm -hmm. against the oppressor. And when we talk about neo-Marxism, really what has happened is they no longer talk about class. They talk about you know other quote unquote protected classes, but everything comes on this power hierarchy. And that has so much has gotten into our higher ed and uh, this leftist worldview that we're seeing a lot of the bitter fruits of that right now. But for me, uh, it's very visceral because uh, those are scars that stay with you, but it gives you great appreciation for what we have. Yeah. The fact that we have a republic that is the first recorded constitution in all of human history that actually limits government. That's what the Bill of Rights does. It doesn't empower you as the individual. It limits what government can do to you. And people are sometimes shocked when I say, if you look even in the United Kingdom, it takes just one act of parliament to yeah. abolish freedom of speech, freedom of religion. So what we have here, it's what I call the American miracle. It's special. Uh, we, I have a great appreciation for what we have, but I also have a visceral dislike of, of communism. That is for darn sure. I know you are a lover of liberty as well. And mm -hmm. so that's one thing I enjoyed was hearing so many of your remarks and your podcasts where you are such a a champion of freedom and individual dignity. Well, and, and let's let's kind of talk about your your role as the attorney general and, and how that's um, met. Because look, if you wanted to go in there, Virginia is, I mean, look, it's it's a purple state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, typically le lately, it has definitely trended more and more left wing. I mean, we see it every day in the Virginia General Assembly where the, those those comments about equity, right, and and this idea of critical theory uh, um, have just become so predominant, and we're starting to see it more within our education system. In fact, the whole stuff that was going on in Loudoun, stuff that was going on in Fairfax County, that got national attention. Um, um, you know, Matt Walsh was talking about it. Um, so we, we, we've dealt with a lot of the, kind of this infiltration of this idea around socialism, around Marxism. And, and to your point, I, I think this is an important distinction. Because it used to be, I think right now, a lot of people think of Marxism and they associate it with class and, and economics. And, right. and what we've seen with you know, Antonio Gramsci and Herbert Marcuse and, and uh, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre and went with the existentialist movement is that, no, Marxism is a way of, of it's a worldview. It's a way of, of explaining the things that go on, the inequities right. within society. And yeah, economics might be a part of that, but they've plugged in a lot of things now that have absolutely nothing to do with it. And and here's the part that troubles me the most. And this really goes into the whole idea of 
you know, lawfare and, and what is the role of, of an attorney general? Because it, you could just say, oh, I just I just enforce the laws of Virginia and I'm the I'm the attorney for the government of Virginia. And, and that's what I do. But when you look at when the when the federal government oversteps its boundaries, when a federal bureaucracy, because we mm. talk a lot about the problem with the federal bureaucracy, oversteps its boundaries. The obligation of the attorney general of a state is not to say, oh, well, I, I guess the federal <laughs> government did it. I guess we're just supposed to go along with this. You actually have to pl- take on the role of saying, we've acknowledged what you've done. We believe it to be unconstitutional, and we're going to fight you on that. Right. Talk about some of your experiences with doing that, because so many people feel right now that we are just getting, we're just getting roasted in the courts. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a great point to from an 80,000 feet view first that how our federal government is 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 completely broken. Uh, it was I'm almost positive it was heritage. If it wasn't heritage, it was AEI. They did an analysis of since Joe Biden has taken office, roughly five percent of all the new laws and regulations impacting Americans are actually pieces of legislation that has gone through the House, gone through the Senate, signed by the president. Ninety five percent has been through these executive orders and regulations promulgated by these unelected administrative bodies. And it has gotten to the point where, uh, you know, I, I somewhat tongue-in-cheek say that, that there are, the three branches of government now is the presidency, the judiciary, and the administrative state. Mm-hmm. And all Congress does is they pass funding bills. Mm-hmm. Um, people want to go, I look at Washington, and, and I think it's broken. Well, they don't have to legislate because they have delegated all of that to these unelected bodies. Uh it's so what I've realized very quickly is when your congressmen and your senators never vote on these so much of what the Biden administration is doing and your governors can't complain about it. But the people that are the front line that are challenging uh, the overstepping of boundaries of the administrative state are your state attorney generals. And I like to joke, um, you know, I get uh, I get to wake up in the morning and sue the federal government. It not only is a fun job, but business is booming yeah. <laughs> uh, because what has happened is they will take. And we can get into the nuances, if you'd like, on where, where Chevron deference came from in the, in the 1980s. It was a Supreme Court decision. But it came to this idea that that a um, that any time an unelected administrative body promulgates a regulation, it is def- the default setting is it must be legal. Yeah. And they have taken that and run with it. I know this shocks you, Nick, that the federal bureaucracy runs with this. Um, to going way outside the boundary, boundaries of what their normal statutory authority is. So, for example, OSHA. This is a great win yeah. that some of your, your watchers and listeners maybe have forgotten, but OSHA, which regulates you know where you put your ladder in your body shop, right? Mm-hmm. The Biden administration used OSHA to promulgate a regulation that would affect over 100 million Americans to say any employer that has 100 or more employees – You have to have your employees vaccinated, and if they refuse to get vaccinated, you have to terminate them. You have to fire them. And this is brought home to me by a friend of mine who runs a trucking company in Southern Virginia. And he called me up and he said, you know, I I have long haulers that that are in their truck for 10, 12, 14 hours a day. They're not around anybody. They've been with my company for decades, and I'm going to have to fire them. And he said, he's like, have you ever tried to call OSHA? (laughs) <laughs> the voice of complaint. Yeah. I said, no. He said, it was a funny exercise. I had my secretary get in, and, and and when she got in at nine, I had her call the ocean number. And when she left at five o'clock, she still hadn't gotten through to anybody. Yeah. And he's like, I know where my congressman is. I know where my senators are. I could go to their district offices. I can write them. You you have an unelected bureaucratic body. And as I told the media, affecting a, a regulation that would affect 100 million Americans, not a bill, no debate in Congress, no hearings, no floor speeches, nothing. And I'm convinced the congressmen and women love this arrangement because mm-hmm. they don't have to have the hard votes. They don't oh, want to yeah. have a vote that says, get your employees vaccinated or fire them. Well, what, what did we do? We took it all the way to the Supreme Court and we won. Yeah. And so we have these wins. That, that vaccine mandate was overturned. Why? Because your state AGs banded together and fought them in court. And it's something we have now tackled on a host of these mandates that the Biden administration has pushed forward. Sometimes it's putting them on notice. They'll propose a regulation. You have a comment period before it goes into effect where we put them on notice. Hey, we're going to sue you and they'll withdraw it. But it is it is a constant battle when you have these unelected bodies that overstep their authority. 
And ultimately, it's not sexy. A lot of people are like, oh, the administrative state, what do you mean? But I think it goes right to the heart of our democracy, because what did the founders most worry about? Two things, anarchy and monarchy. Mm -hmm. They did not want, from a, from a monarchical standpoint, the idea of too much power in one body was, was against them. So that's why we have the separation of powers. Well, that's exactly what you have in many ways with an unelected body promulgate regulations that's not accountable to anybody. Then obviously they're worried about anarchy, and that's why they believed in a Bill of Rights and protecting people from the passions, the, uh, protecting the minority from the passions of the majority. So I would say it's gotten to the point where it's hurting our democracy. When less than 5% are being passed by Congress, it's a problem. When, when you talk about authoritarianism, and, and I would argue that that authoritarian component is what worried them, and that was most often my, or, or most often manifested in a monarchical system when you're looking at the founders. What is even more nefarious about a bureaucratic state is that when the monarch oppresses you, <laughs> I know who the monarch is. Yep. Like I can at least point to the, the subject or the author of my oppression and say that guy's the problem. But when it's some like bureaucrat sitting in an office somewhere, and, and I've had people ask me before, like, well then how do you know how does this happen? To your point, it's really easy. A legislature passes a bill which says we want X to come about. We want something right. to be done, right? We want we want the environment to be cleaner. And so X agency will promulgate regulations right. in order to achieve X, Y, and Z. And now the next thing you know, you've just opened up this huge world for a bureaucrat, the executive branch, to now effectively operate as its own legislature. Right. So do you think, like when, when we talk about like bad Supreme Court decisions, because th this is another thing that's near and dear to my heart, is you know, the Supreme Court saying that we have decided X and so that is now, now that makes it constitutional. There's still a role for AGs to push back and challenge that and take it to court and, and question that. Do you think that that do you think that that increase of power of the bureaucratic state has been one of the worst Supreme Court decisions that we've had in the last fifty years? Yeah, I mean it dates back to a Chevron decisions. What's it titled? Ex explain that a little bit. All right, about so Chevron, happened. believe it or not, it was I, I think it was a Scalia decision. I know it surprises it was Scalia mm -hmm. that drove, drafted it. I, I he later hinted that he was really almost surprised at at how it had run amok. But it was a Chevron. It's called Chevron deference, and it's the idea that a, a administrative agency. If their power has been granted to them, in other words, Congress voluntarily gives up your power, gives it to this administrative agency to propagate regulations, and that any regulation they propose is the deference, the default assumption is it's legal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's incredibly high burden to then overturn. It's not impossible, but it's a high burden when they overstep their statutory authority, which we did in West Virginia versus EPA. The mm -hmm. EPA was using a statute to suddenly essentially try to regulate coal plants out of existence. <clears throat> and so uh, that was another very successful case. We took West Virginia versus EPA. There's actually a case on the docket right now, the Supreme Court, that could could overturn Chevron deference. Mm -hmm. uh, Justice Gorsuch, it's is a almost a passion project. Uh, he has written some pretty scathing uh, comments in the past about the nature of Chevron deference and how it can distort democracy. And so there is some thinking that uh, there's a couple things that may happen. Either they're going to uphold Chevron and keep it the way it is. I don't think they're going to do it. They're going to greatly restrict it, which I think is a high possibility, or they may overturn it entirely. So let me ask you this. And that's going to be decided in the next couple, next month or two. Well, well, well let me ask you this, because he, here's the here's the problem that I have with, you know, our, our current composition of the Supreme Court is that we have a couple of members up there that think that their obligation is not to necessarily be true to the Constitution, but to be true to the institution, which is to mm. say that in order for the Supreme Court to maintain credibility within the population, we have to essentially make decisions that will be popular. And that can be incredibly damaging. Um, so do you see a situation where, like, so for instance, on these successes that you've had right. with, with EPA, with OSHA, yeah. what has been what has been the composition of the vote on the Supreme Court on that? 9-0, 5-4, what are we talking about? You're generally looking like it is 6-3. So 6-3 six, six, is a little bit better All than, right, you six, know. Three. Um, and, and who's usually breaking, because, uh, you know. If, well, Roberts is always a question mark, as yes. we know. We've seen a couple of times where uh, Kavanaugh and a couple of administrative rulings hasn't been as consistent. Uh, but sometimes, I want to be clear, it doesn't necessarily have to go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, sometimes you push back and private enterprise, for example, uh, ESG. 
yeah. right? Environmental social governance, the idea that you'll no longer seek to maximize the profits, that you'll somehow come to this nebulous term that will determine um, what your fiduciary duty is as a shareholder. Yeah. And ERISA, which is a law that dates back to the 70s, um, it's your Employee Retirement Income Security Act. I might be might butcher the acronym. But the idea is ERISA protects that if I am an investor mm -hmm. and I am entrusted with your retirement and I'm investing it, mm -hmm. ERISA essentially for years, the fiduciary duty is your number one, Joel, is if I'm entrusting you with my hard-earned dollars after tax dollars to invest, your number one goal is to goal is to grow that money. Yeah. Right. Well, the Biden administration tried to reinterpret ERISA mandates. Again, not a law through Congress. Suddenly saying, well, you can also factor in ESG. <laughs> right. And and how we define ESG. Again, yeah. they bypass Congress because, as you know, legislating is tough and hard, and it requires you to, to actually persuade people. And so we banded together and really pushed back on this radical reinterpretation of ERISA. And we've been quite successful. Not only that, we've been successful. We have put some of these huge companies on notice that are now starting to walk back the ESG because I think they finally listened to the corporate cancel and said, uh, you're not looking to maximize uh, your, your fiduciary duty to yeah. shareholders yeah. on this ESG. So they're actually starting to walk that back because – Canley, they're getting such legal exposure. And I think that's one thing that the AGs have done. We've kind of joked in some ways we're the sheriff of Washington, pushing back on a host of these uh, issues. And sometimes it doesn't require taking to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it just requires the resource of the AG's office, putting people, putting the administrative state on notice, that we're going to push back on some of this kind of far left, left wing worldview. So th that's that's an important component because I think the other thing that frustrates people is this idea that th the feds are just throwing, th these bureaucratic agencies are throwing a thousand things out there, stuff slips through, people get tired of fighting, or there's always a question of standing, right? You might be personally affected or maybe indirectly affected, but that doesn't mean that you have the resources to go and take on the federal government in court. Yeah. And there has been this tendency within government organizations to essentially say, we can sue without end because we have the full resources of the taxpayers we're suing or that we're, that we're um, going up against, whereas the taxpayers put in an enormous disadvantage yeah. unless it's AG offices. AG. Yeah. yeah. So let, let me ask you this. I mean, this is another thing that bothers me philosophically. The same people crying our democracy. Now, look, we understand we live in a constitutional republic that utilizes democratic processes right. in order to achieve electoral ends. That's how we pass legislation. But the same people that cry the loudest, that say the loudest, our democracy, our democracy, our democracy, are the same ones that seem to be incredibly comfortable with using the administrative state and bypassing that entire electoral, that, that intended process. Right. Right in order to go through the committees, in order to do that that difficult work. And, and I will say this, I carried a bill in Virginia that was a lot like the RAINS Act that Rand Paul's been trying to pass on the federal level, which essentially limits what the administrative state can right. do outside of what the legislature is authorized. Right. And I, I got pushed back from Republicans because it was, well, this is going to be really difficult. And, oh my gosh, this means we're going to have to do more of this and we're going to have to pour over yeah. that. And we really need the experts to be able right. to decide. Like, no, you need to do your your job. <laughs> um, so, so what do you, okay, what do you say with, like, do you think, do you think we're having an impact? Do you think the administrative state is starting to recognize that, oh my gosh, we're being, we're being watched with a much higher level of scrutiny and we're losing, we're losing these things in court. Has it slowed um, yeah. Has it yeah. slowed their desire to try to ram this stuff home? Or are they are they getting the message at all? I mean, I do think, to your point, I know you and I both are enormous Thomas Sowell fans, mm -hmm. and he wrote a, a fantastic uh, a, a book years ago that I think in many ways is as relevant today as when he first wrote it, called The Vision of the Anointed. Yeah. And I know you've read it. And the idea is, is that, and this is something that you've kind of seen, I think, particularly on the far left, is this vision of we we have the proper vision of how to organize society and organize in some ways even your own family yeah and uh, trust us and put the experts into the expert class as they call it and we we can better better society um, the problem is and George Friedman um, has written a lot of this at, at geopolitical futures on the crisis of government and what he has attributed to is people realize particularly COVID accelerated this that people realize that you're an expert of one thing does not mean you're an expert of all things. Mm -hmm. And very rarely do they realize, even Fauci admitted, um, um, and maybe it was Collins, I forget which one, admitted that uh, as 
as doctors during COVID, they were most focused on the medical side, not thinking about the impact in the economy and yeah. even our children's educational attainment. So I think, first of all, that is a little bit of the mindset. Um, to give you an example of, of the pushback, I would never forget when my staff came in and said, you know, we may have to look at litigation against the USDA. And I said, you know, of all the federal agencies were involved in litigation, that's a new one. Mm -hmm. Where is this coming from? They said, well, the USDA administers the school lunch program for poor and needy kids. I go, well, that's interesting. And they said, well, uh, how long have they been doing that? Years? Okay, that's fine. Uh, well, the Biden administration is now adding a twist. I was like, well, what do you mean? Well, they have now decided that uh, if you're a school district that accepts even so much as a dollar of federal assistance to administer reduced lunches to poor and needy kids at school, you also have to adopt the Biden administration's transgendered policies, yeah. which is biological boys and women's sports teams and in locker rooms and in overnight trips. And it would affect over 90 percent of the school districts in the country. Not a, not again, not a bill through Congress, not a debate. Mm -hmm. You think any you think Abigail Spanberger or Mark Warner, Tim Kaine wants to have that vote? <laughs> no. Right? Of course not. No. So uh, what we did is that at the time it was a proposed regulation. A bunch of the other AGs put the Biden administration on notice. Says if this proposed regulation gets tries to actually become a rule and gets implemented, we will take you to court. And the Biden administration then withdrew the regulation, clearly because they understood that you have some like-minded AGs that are not afraid to challenge it. So yeah. again – Something that didn't get a lot of focus. Again, something that would affect 90% of the school districts in the country. Uh, we were able to push back on that successfully without even filing litigation, without even getting uh, to the Supreme Court. But you are so right, Nick. Whenever you push back on the administrative state, I remember when I was in the House, I carried a bill that was going to say any new regulation coming out of DPOR would require – it was basically bottled on something they had done in Colorado years ago. But it said that every new regulation – New regulation have to, in by year four, report back to the General Assembly the, the estimated economic impact mm -hmm. of the regulation, what's its costing, what's its mm -hmm. unintended benefits. And if it was having a net negative impact, then that needed to go to the floor of the House for a vote. Yeah. And you would have thought that I was proposing like this really novel idea. I remember presenting in a committee saying, well, I think we need to maybe send this to a study. And they, eventually they didn't even send it to a study. They killed it. But it goes to this idea, which is uh, the best way to cure democracy in some ways is is getting back to representative government mm -hmm. and making sure these individuals, because I think it was Ronald Reagan said the only thing that has eternal life on this earth in many ways is a government program, yeah. right? And uh, at least for me, when I was served in the General Assembly, I always had a three-part test when it comes to legislation. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Because mm -hmm. oftentimes that bill won't even solve the problem. Um, uh, uh, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Does this bill solve the problem? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't solve it half the time. And then third, what are the unintended consequences? Mm -hmm. And that is oftentimes the biggest failure in government. Nobody bothers to think about the unintended consequences. And it's only in government that they measure success by their intentions. Yes. Could When you were a Green Beret, could they measure success by your intentions? <laughs> you Nick? could try. Right. You're last long. Right. You're not last long. <laughs> if you're a private entrepreneur, could you measure success by what you intend to make mm -hmm. that quarter? No. If you were on a sports team and you get a the coach says, why did you call an audible and, and go for it on fourth and 27? Yeah. Well, coach, I intended to get a first down, yeah. right? <laughs> but it is only in government where yeah. where they basically say, do not measure me by by the results. Only measure me by my intentions. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think is one of our biggest problems in government today, whether it's in the administrative state or even a legislative body, that too often people ask you, only measure by what I intend. And I think that is that is another aspect that's distorting democracy. Well, and I think that Thomas Sowell talks about this too, again, to bring up Sowell again. Um, he, he always talked about the problem in government is a lot of times we talk about solutions when in reality what we're dealing with is trade-offs. Exactly. And – and I, I can't tell you how many times I have been frustrating where when we are going through the process on the floor of listening to our colleagues describe a bill right. and what they describe is their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. <laughs> I, I remember this, I remember with, with increasing the minimum wage again, it was this, oh, this is going to bring, this is going to lift thousands of people out of poverty and it's going to do this and it's going to do that. I said, no, you hope it will do that. Here's what you actually did legally. If you want to describe your bill, here's what you did. You made it illegal to offer someone a job for anything less than $13.49 an hour. 
And in Lee County, Virginia, the average individual income is $18,000 a year. So what you did was you shut down a bunch of economic opportunities for them in order to impact parts of your state or parts of your area. They're not going to be impacted by this at all. But it didn't matter because the look at all these wonderful intentions that we have. Okay, let me I, I want to transition a little bit because this is something that they actually made fun of um, some candidates here in Virginia when they were asking him about what are some of the issues that are that are facing impacting Virginia? And they said immigration. They said the border. And it was, oh my gosh, you guys are not even, do you guys, have you even seen a map? Do you know how far away Virginia is from the border? Yeah. Because as you know, this is, you know, nobody ever moves, leaves out of Texas or, or Arizona or California. Um, I, I will say that I think it's amazing how Governor Abbott and, uh, and Governor DeSantis have demonstrated to New York Washington, D.C., Chicago, that this can very easily become their problem as well. But what do, again, when, when you're looking at this um, as a problem that's impacting the country as a whole, but also impacting specifically Virginia, what is the role of the AG on something like this? Well, I do think that the what is happening in the border is the national security moment of our time. And I'm sure you saw the, the famous clip on election night when it showed that the uh, one of the top issues for voters – uh, in Virginia was immigration. Mm -hmm. And they uh, very snarkily said, what, immigration from West Virginia? Mm -hmm. And it just shows how out of touch so many of these individuals are. Uh, to put things in perspective, since Joe Biden has taken office, you've had over 8 million uh, illegal crossings into the United States. Uh, it is the largest single migration into America since our founding. Mm. It is a population larger than 32 states. Yeah. Uh, so one, you have a humanitarian crisis. You have a fentanyl crisis. Enough is crossing our southern border to kill every man, woman, and child in this country three times over. You have the Sinaloa cartel, which I think is the most dangerous criminal enterprise on the planet. It makes the, the Italian mafia look like the Boy Scouts, uh, taking advantage of that both with drugs and human trafficking, which is own separate tragedy. But what has happened as a result is you have individuals where we don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. Nick, you've had 241 individuals on the FBI terrorist watch list that have been apprehended at the border in just the last 18 months. Yeah. When you look at who has gotten through, probably double that mm -hmm. number. So you have hundreds of people that I don't know. Now ask yourself this, this question. Why, if you're on the FBI terrorist watch list, would you be trying to sneak into a country that wants to arrest you? Mm -hmm. And that number, uh, the last year of the Trump administration, was six. So something is going on, and, and these are not individuals. I want to be clear. When you look at the list, and I, and I get data from Homeland Security all the time, the list is not just – it's Chinese nationals. Mm -hmm. It's individuals from the Middle East. Oh, it's been like it's, thousands of right, Chinese thousands, nationals. Thousands, thousands. We're not talking about like 12. Right, right. They have, well, they have a youth unemployment rate in China of, of 20%. Yeah. And they're, they are facing the greatest demographic collapse in all of human history. I, I saw one study that showed estimated population of China – our, our current population is about 300 some plus million. Estimated by 2070 will be about 500 million. Mm -hmm. uh, their current population is 1.2 billion. It's estimated by the year 2070, there'll be about 550 million. Yeah, it's nuts. It, it's nuts. So uh, they've committed demographic suicide. Um, but on our border, you've had an unholy alliance between the Chinese Communist Party and the drug cartels, two of the worst actors on the planet. And then uh, so every state is a border state. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at statistics, the number one killer of youth in, Amer in, in Virginia, for example, year after year for years is automobile fatalities. Uh, the last six plus years, it has been uh, uh, drug overdoses. Mm -hmm. And you know, for your listeners to understand how this works, 70% of the counterfeit pills on the street are laced with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So I talked to a family where um, their son was worried about a final exam. A friend of his said, you should take Adderall, help you study. Mom and dad on a Sunday night were downstairs watching a movie. Their son went on Snapchat, Venmoed with a dealer, delivered to his home in a brown bag. Uh, he took what he thought was Adderall, was laced with fentanyl. They found them overdosed in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's happening right now. So every state is a border state. What we have done is band together to both sue the federal government and also uh, join in amicus briefs and others with states like Florida that are taking this quite seriously. 
Um, it is fascinating to me, though, because so much of the assumption that the left has had, which is a bold-faced lie, is that the fact that those that came here legally will somehow support illegal immigration. Yeah. Actually, no. No. They went through the process properly, like my mother did. Yeah. And so they are the most... That's why you're seeing in a lot of these counties on the border that are 50, 60 percent Latino counties are trending Republican now yeah. because they're tired of the lawlessness. So it is affecting every aspect. We just had another report last week of a, somebody who came over the border, was let go by ICE, uh, and then is now accused of raping a 14-year-old girl in Campbell County, Virginia. And this is the last point. 83% of the people that are apprehended at the border, you know, when you get a speeding ticket, you'll get a piece of paper that says, we'll see you in four or five yeah. months. They get an asylum hearing in four or five years. And I know this shocks you, Nick. <laughs> 90% of those do not show up to their hearings. So yeah. it is a catch and release program where they catch them, they let them go, they say, we'll see, hey, we'll see you in four or five years, and they don't show up. We don't know where they are. And so this is a moment unlike any other. This is a national, it's a, it's at the heart, it's a national sovereignty. A country that has no control over its border is, is not a sovereign nation. Well, the other part that pisses me off about this, and, and I say this as someone that two days ago I was on the phone with Jennifer Wexton's office trying to help a, a woman who her mother brought her over from Guatemala when she was two years old, right? Got the, get the game, yeah. catch and release, didn't show up to her court hearing, right? At this stage, she is married to an American citizen, has four kids, right? And now she just got notification that she's going to be deported. And this is another thing that infuriates people because one, the left says, ah, see, this is a perfect example of why we need these programs like DOC and everything. Like, no, 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 no. This is a perfect example of the administrative state, once again, not properly prioritizing what should be done. Look, I, I have full sympathy for someone that was brought over here when they were two and they had no they had no cognitive ability to make the decision one way or another. They got married. They've got kids now. They're married to an American citizen. I, I understand saying, look, we need there's some sort of pathway for this. But when you do things like like the left has done, and, and I pointed this out before, I did this in a debate once that was kind of set up to show what an un uncompassionate, horrible human being I was because how could I not support something like DACA? And I said, okay, let, let's use the most sympathetic version. You are two parents in you know El Salvador during the height of MS-13 just destroying that country. There's been a lot of changes since then. but And so you, you hear that if your child comes over, they can stay. Well, that, that provides a pretty powerful incentive for parents that we could certainly associate ourselves with on wanting a better life for their children. So what do you do? Do you get on the phone and call up a travel agency and just fly your kids in? No, you end up working with criminal organizations who tell you, right, because they've got their own front organizations trying to entice people to hand over their kids or whatever it is, telling you that, oh, we'll get your kids into the country and then you'll be able to join them. And then at that point, because of DACA and whatnot, you'll be able to say because we don't want to separate families. So what ends up happening? Oh, well, it turns out the Sinola cartel Mm -hmm. did not have the best interests of your children in mind. And now they were used either for labor or to traffic drugs or to traffic weapons, or they were used for the sex trade. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we incentivized, exactly. we incentivize your, your intention exactly. may have been great, but you created a perverse incentive. And, and now the people, I would argue that some of the people that have been hurt worst are, are, are children that I, I certainly have no ill intention toward and, yeah. and so people look at this and they're frustrated. So how do, we, how do you combat the narrative? Because again, you're, you're yeah. a child of immigrants, yeah. right? I've been yeah. to the border and I've talked to families there. Same way, they're first, second, third generation. They hate what's going on at the southern border. Not because they hate brown people. They are brown people, right? They hate this <laughs> idea that we're incentivizing bad behavior and that we're incentivizing dangerous activities. So what, what yeah. do you do about that? Well, it is what I said earlier about how government so many people in government measure success by their intentions. Yeah. You're exactly right. They have given an incentive exactly for this. And what has led to this is untold misery. Uh, there are now terms entering into law enforcement lexicon that simply didn't exist uh, several years ago. Terms like rape trees, which I'm not going to get into the, to that, but they are exploiting these young people. The, the going price the cartels are charging to get over the border is about $15,000. These are so many of these are individuals that come from abject poverty. And so it is modern day slavery. They either have to work it off with sex or with their labor. Mm -hmm. And so they have created an environment that creates this economic incentive to exploit these young people. The president right now could sign a simple and executive order 
that simply adopts the Trump administration's Remain in Mexico policy, yeah. which says if you want asylum, but by the way, you can go on any of these social media accounts and they train you what to say. When you're stopped by federal authorities, all you have to say is I'm seeking asylum. Mm -hmm. And that's when they give you that piece of paper that says we'll see you in 2028 or 2029. And they're like, go. Um, but the Biden administration could sign a simple executive order right now that would create, which is why we got serious control under the Trump administration and why we don't have now, to say you have to remain in Mexico to apply for asylum. Um, that also gives the Mexican government incentive to get some control over this. Mm -hmm. Um, but that is the problem that you have right now. Is so let me, let me interrupt you yeah. real quick because the Biden administration loves to come forward right now because they, they requested an, a new bill and this was going to give them the authority to do everything that they needed to do to protect the border. And Republicans voted no, because they want the issue. They don't want to give the president the authority and power he needs to fix this. Why is that bull crap? Well, it's like saying the guy who set the house on fire is suddenly <laughs> asking for a half measure and you're like, no, we need real substantive border Control the Biden administration refuses to implement the Remain in Mexico policy. Uh, wh what he has tried to do is do window dressing that doesn't actually address the root cause of the problem. And so it's an easy executive order that he can actually implement, and give the authority right now. But you talk to some of these border agents, you talk to these actual, and I, my heart breaks for a lot of these, the border agents that are so frustrated mm -hmm. um, because they feel abandoned by their leadership. Uh, they're trying to do the right thing. They've been demonized by this administration at every turn, and, they, and they're not given the tools to do their job. That's a frustration that law enforcement uh, feels uh, right now at the border. And so they feel like they see the cartels are operating with a certain level of sophistication that is mind-boggling because they can just buy the best intelligence. Yeah. Um, but the Biden administration has broken the border, and they don't have a plan, a substantive plan to fix it. A big step can simply be – uh, returning to the Remain in Mexico policy. He may do that because the amazing thing, what they've slowly realized is this is becoming a top issue, not just for voters in Texas and Arizona, but everywhere. Yeah. And I do, I have found a little bit humorous, the sanctuary city mayors that very, that sat back with a lot of <laughs> sanctimony and, and, and now they are reversing course yeah. with just a fraction. I mean, just a fraction of what is being experienced at the border right now is overwhelming the resources in a lot of these communities New York, Chicago, and others. Well, what has been happening at these have been going on for a decade. Yeah. And um, decades almost. So there is a step forward. We are a generous country. We're, we are a country that has been incredibly generous, given second chances to families like mine. And so we allow about a million legal immigrants a year. So we're already the most generous country on the planet when it comes mm -hmm. to legal immigration. Mm -hmm. But the one thing the American people do not like is to feel like they're being taken advantage of. And I think that's why you're seeing this pop up in a lot of pollings in Virginia, in New York, in states far away from the borders, because the American people realize, whoa, 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 this is this is not working out. To show you the level of where we are, tuberculosis. My mother came here. She had to be screened for tuberculosis. Everybody does. You have to give an extensive medical history of who you are. Do you realize the California Department of Health issued a notice last month? to all of its healthcare providers about a new strain of tuberculosis that has a 13% fatality rate. Jeez. Where do you think that's coming from? Yeah. That's not coming from legal immigrants that have to be screened for well, and, and a So diseases we thought were eradicated are now coming back. It's, well, and, it's and, and, really and remarkable. Let's think about this for a second. Let's think about this for a second. COVID. Right. Ended up having a significantly lower, like, okay, let's, let's be generous. Let's say initially we weren't sure. There was a lot of concern what was going to be. It never even got close Right. to 13 percent and gavin newsom locked down the entire well i mean except for the french laundry well, when he had he, to go he eat, bulldozed right? a skate park with yeah. sand yeah when now we know that the doctors all said well you know being out in the open in the air that's actually you know that's a whole separate you and i lived through that yeah. the, the government response to covid after the fact <clears throat> it right now the narrative they're so desperate to protect the narrative nobody yeah. wants to admit they're wrong the the books the 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 newspaper articles the investigative reporters it's going to be so damning even 10 15 20 years from now yeah. what happened but a classic example of people wanting to judge success even today by their intentions and not the results and and that's why when you do that, government never can improve. Well, and, and it's amazing. Again, the same California that could actually do more to actually secure their own border right. along Mexico in order to prevent a disease coming in with a 13% fatality rate. Nope, they don't want to do it because it goes right. against their narrative. Follow the science, my... Mm. <laughs> All right, let me ask you. I'm going to ask because I know 
you know, time's limited, but I want to ask you, I want to ask you a tough legal question. And this, this is around the border. Okay. Um, now, the, if you look at the United States Constitution, and you and I are both big advocates of, you know, interpreting the Constitution properly, Texas decided, look, the federal government's not doing its job. We're going to deploy our own forces in, in order to ensure that it's done. You get a Supreme Court brief comes back and mm-hmm. upholds that, yes, the, the border uh, and, and immigration – and protection from foreign invasion and all those things does fall within the jurisdiction of the federal government. So Texas is now in a position where it says, okay, technically this is not our jurisdiction, but don't we have a responsibility to protect our own citizens? And and the federal government's very, very good at explaining to all of us what their authority is. Well, sometimes forgetting that that also comes with responsibility. So Texas kind of told the feds where they could stick it, right? Kind of. Kind of. Not I mean, totally. the, the, the feds very notably did not really rule on the merits nor their reasoning. Yeah. And so they left enough ambiguity to the states. And this is something you see the Supreme Courts do. Yeah. They leave enough ambiguity where, you know, when Thomas Jefferson called the states the laboratories of democracy, it's almost like the Supreme Court signaled to Texas, figure this out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Texas actually approached a model, which I thought was interesting, where they essentially passed a state law mm-hmm. That said, if you then re-enter the country uh, illegally, uh, you're in violation of state law. Mm -hmm. And so there are some different innovative ways that states have been able to tackle this. But they're having to do this because the federal government fundamentally has failed. And what I think is one of the most important core functions of government, right, Mm -hmm. is protecting your national sovereignty. And they have failed at that. And so now Texas has to step in. And you're already seeing a shift in the migration pattern. When I get reports of what's coming over the border and where, you're already seeing a huge drop in Texas. And where are they now flowing into? I know this shocks you, California mm-hmm. and to a lesser extent, Arizona. Arizona even has a Democratic governor who says this is not sustainable. It's only Gavin Newsom who somehow, <laughs> uh, you know, as I like to joke, if you don't think leadership matters, go to California. It's sunny year round, no humidity, virtually no bugs. And uh, 200,000 people a year moving out. Yeah. You, mi- you must be really bad at your job in Sacramento mm-hmm. to have an impact on that. But but uh, it is interesting, I mean, on that, the federal government somewhat, in a way, silent, it, indicating to the states, figure this out on your own. Yeah. Which was interesting. It, it was not necessarily a complete – it wasn't the way the media portrayed it. It was actually the, – the way they handled it actually gave – I think some freedom of movement for Texas is which is what they're doing. Well, I think it's going to be interesting too to see. Like, I, I the feds could have pushed back more on that issue, and I think they chose not to because they realized that they had lost they had lost the narrative. Right. Which is strange for the left because when you when when you have a great deal of influence over the most culturally shaping institutions in the country, be it education, the media, or Hollywood, typically you don't lose control of the narrative unless you've screwed up. So really horribly bad. bad. Right. And and I right. do think I do think it's interesting that you even look at you know the mayor of New York, the mayor of Chicago, the mayor of um uh, Washington, DC, and you look at their overall wh- what is their approach is their approach to say, okay, we get it. We're now having to deal with this problem as well. It is overwhelming. My gosh, if it's bad for us, it must be horrible for you. No, their argument is we need more money from the federal government. I mean, it, it's it's amazing to me how insulated, it, even when they are feeling the the um the stress and the consequences of their own policy positions it doesn't cause them to question gosh maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with the way that we viewed this no no it's just everyone needs to pay more taxes and give it to us so we can deal with this problem of our own creation <laughs> yeah, um, they they get in an ideological straitjacket that they simply cannot get themselves out of and mm-hmm. so they got an ideological straitjacket that when it came to immigration every single policy from the previous administration must have been bad because it was a Republican administration that did it. And now they're dealing with the bitter fruits of that because it's impacting Biden's polling numbers and that immigration, which was not a top issue in 2016, is now a top issue of likely voters as well as inflation. Because I know this may shock everybody, but when you spend money like Argentina, you yeah. can't be surprised when you get inflation like yeah. Argentina, right? Yeah. So, At least Argentina is now doing something about it. <laughs> yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Um, all right, so let me let me ask you this. It's kind of like a closing thought. Um what should people know and what should and probably most importantly what should they expect from their state attorney general 
because it, again, it's easy to just say top chief law enforcement officer. Uh, I'm the attorney for the state or everything like right. that. Right. If we if we want to be if if we genuinely want to be a free people, that requires so much more than simply getting to vote for politicians every two, four to six years. Right. And and I don't believe I really I don't believe it's good enough to just say oh well that's the Republican candidate. I can show you a lot of Republicans that don't actually believe on a fundamental right. level on the concepts of individual liberty, free markets, property rights, right? They, they, they just don't. So what should people who genuinely do want a, a stricter adherence to not just the Constitution, but the principles from which it was derived, right. what should they expect and really demand out of their attorney general? Well, I know this shocks you, Nick, but not every AG... Uh, has that mindset that part of your job is to push back on gross federal overreach. And so what I would, I, I, I know I'm bragging a little bit and only in the sense, not for me, but uh, it wasn't until I got in this position that I realized how important the attorney general role is mm -hmm. in pushing back on extreme federal overreach. And so what I would put towards voters, and I know you have podcast listeners all over the podcast listeners over the, all over the country. It's great to pay attention to, you know, your Republican primaries for Senate or for Congress, very important. But you need to really pay attention to your state attorney general mm -hmm. uh, because they really can have a seismic impact on uh, what is happening in your state to say we're on behalf of the state of Idaho or on this, this behalf of the state of Arizona or, or pick your, Oklahoma, we're going to represent our citizens to push back. And so, uh, you know, I, I used to joke that your local district attorney was the most important race that nobody ever paid attention to. I would argue some ways from a state perspective, uh, your your attorney general could be one of the most important uh, uh, state offices that, that people don't pay attention to enough. Um, and so they can really be at the front line of protecting your individual liberties and your, and, and your state's place in being part of these lawsuits. It has been, though, a joy to, to band together with so many of the other like-minded AGs on so many other of the other on the other suits. But I would also say that uh, it's easy for your listeners, I'm sure, to feel like, oh my gosh, um, you know, the, the federal government's growing too fast, too much, too soon. Uh, we don't get any wins. I hope that we've been able to show a few of our wins, and mm -hmm. we have a lot more we could have gone on a long time about. They don't get enough attention. But I would just simply tell every one of your, your listeners and watchers, uh, they need to reject apathy. Mm. That scares me more than an out-of-control federal government is a sense of everyday Americans just being apathetic, saying nothing will change. And the reality is, is that, um, I don't know about you, and I know you feel this in your bones, I feel it on my bones, that America is indeed worth both fighting for and preserving. Mm -hmm. We are indeed the last best hope on earth. And I remember having a conversation with my mother pretty recently where she just kind of almost offhand said, you know, if America would have, was, it, was to fall, I, I'd have nowhere else to go to. Mm -hmm. And that's when you kind of realize we are ultimately we're unique people. Uh, and it requires everybody to reject apathy and get in the game. Uh, apathy is the easy part. It's easy to sit back and say, you know what? I just not going to get involved anymore. But democracy is a, is not a spectator sport. And so being involved, being engaged, make sure that you are engaged with who your AG is communicate with them. Mm -hmm. You know, that regulation or that executive order you don't like, don't write your senator or your de or your congressman. Write your state attorney general and mm -hmm. ask them, what are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. uh, because that is so much of where the game is right now. And are, are they engaged with other uh, Republican AGs to help band together the pushback on uh, the administrative state? And if not, you need to ask hard questions why they aren't. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. So tell everyone, I mean, obviously you have your official channels with respect to the you know office of the attorney general, but any other places that people can kind of follow. So you're sending yes. out a message about what's going on social media. Well, I'm on Instagram. Uh, we are, if you want to sign up to get email updates, I know everybody wants more emails, right? <laughs> Jason or, uh, and that's M I Y A R E S.com. Follow me on Twitter, just, uh, Jason Miara's V A for Virginia. And you can give updates of what we're doing. Uh, we want to be as available. We're not nearly as cool and as hip on the social media front as Nick Friedis. In fact, yeah. it was kind of funny when I was getting text messages from my daughter with videos of Nick Friedis. And I'm like, oh, that's a good one from Nick. And she was so impressed that I knew you. She's like, wait, how do you know this guy? I was like, I, I served with him. And she actually didn't believe me. So, um, it, it, Nick, I do have to commend you. You do a great job uh, both reaching out and reaching a new generation of 
of young people as well. I know that social media is, is where they get the vast, vast bulk of their bulk of their news. I think you do a great job on it. So it's it's a real pleasure to to get on this podcast. Actually, uh, my kids are pretty impressed that I got invited <laughs> on. So thank you for making me cool. Oh no, no, it's my pleasure. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm working overtime to make it so. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the important work that you and all of your your staff and uh, attorneys are doing at the uh, at the AG's office. And uh, please, please continue to uh, to fight for those principles. Once again, thank no you for question. joining us. And thank you all for watching. Uh, please let us know what you think in the comments. Again, if you happen to like what we're doing here, liking and subscribing is always much appreciated. But uh, again, we're never going to compel you to do it. I'm not going to carry any legislation forcing you to like and subscribe. But if you'd like to voluntarily do so, it'd certainly be appreciated. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next episode.